John David Norman was our country's most prolific child trafficker. Norman began his criminal career in Houston, where he was arrested in 1954, and again in 1956, for child molestation. His next arrest was in California in 1963 for sexual assault, then again in 1969, where he was convicted for the distribution of obscene material and sentenced to 15 months. By 1973, Norman had established a child prostitution ring he named the Odyssey Foundation. His service covered the entire United States, major Canadian cities, and parts of Europe. Norman used a mail forwarding address based in San Diego to reach his customers. His base of operations was located in Dallas. Norman did not rely on ads alone. He spent his days scouring bus stations and arcades looking for runaways. In August of that year, Norman brought a 21-year-old male prostitute named Charles Brizendine to Dallas for one of his clients. While nosing around in Norman's apartment, Brizendine found several photos of boys with the word kill written on them. Due to recent reports of a mass murder in Houston, Brizendine became terrified. As he had responded to Norman's ad in The Advocate, he called their office. An employee at the Advocate told Brizendine to immediately call the FBI, which he did. The FBI then contacted Dallas police. On August 14th, police raided Norman's business. After searching the premises, Dallas police found some 50,000 index cards. Around 5 to 10% of these were the names and physical descriptions of boys in his network. Most were aged 13 to 19. The remainder were Norman's clients. His filing system separated the clients into three categories using a color-coded system. Using a hypothetical set of colors, red indicated the individual received pamphlets through the mail from Norman. Blue indicated the individual has contacted Mr. Norman by phone expressing their interest in meeting boys. Green indicated that the individual was running a child stable, generally a dormitory or an apartment building. The events which unfolded in Texas between 1970 through 1976 are one of the worst failures of state and federal law enforcement in American history. Although Wayne wants no part in the homosexual rapes, he joins more and more in the slow torture and sadistic killing of his friends. Inside Dean's house, the naked victims are handcuffed to this plywood board at gunpoint. The floor is covered with vinyl sheets to catch their blood. The stereo is turned up to drown out their screams. The horrified boys see Dean get undressed and hope it's only rape. Then they see Wayne take out the hunting knife. One summer night in 1973, Dean Coral suddenly tries to rape and murder Wayne. On August 8, 1973, a 33-year-old Houston man named Dean Arnold Coral was shot to death inside his father's home. In the six days between his murder and John Norman's Dallas arrest, police had dug up the bodies of 27 boys and young men. While in high school, Coral had worked at his mother's candy store in Houston. After being drafted into the Army, Coral returned to Houston in June of 1965. He gained employment with Houston Lighting and Power and worked nights in the candy store, which was now located directly across from an elementary school. Coral installed a pool table in the back room of the store and began to entertain the neighborhood children. Besides candy and games, Coral had rigged up a large green frog, whose eyes lit up whenever the phone rang. One of the boys Coral befriended was a 12-year-old named David Owen Brooks. Almost immediately, Coral began molesting the boy. Brooks lived with Dean Coral on and off for the next four years. In October of 1970, a now 16-year-old David Brooks walked in on Coral as he was murdering a 19-year-old named Reuben Watson. 
Some accounts claim Coral bought Brooks a Corvette to keep his mouth shut. While this may be true, it certainly is not the whole story. Coral acquired a green 1969 Corvette, which did not run. After this, he had the teenage Brooks steal a 1971 Super Sport Camaro. The engine and transmission were then swapped into the Corvette. Owens did drive the Corvette around town. What young boy would turn down a ride in a Corvette driven by a teenager? Soon after this, Coral befriended a 15-year-old named Elmer Wayne Henley. Brooks and Henley then worked together, luring local boys to Coral. Coral had repeatedly told both Henley and Brooks that he sold kids to an outfit in Dallas. There is an extreme likelihood that Coral used John Norman's child prostitution service to procure his victims as well. Coral transported the boys' bodies to burial sites in a homemade plywood box. He had Brooks and Henley dig the graves. Coral brought a large piece of carpet for the boys to pile excess dirt on, so no mound would be visible when they left the gravesite. Dean Coral had another homemade box permanently installed in his van. The boys described this box as looking like a coffin with air holes. Neither offered any stories about Coral ever using this in their presence. Another little reported fact about Coral was his handcuff game. Coral would tell his victims that he had a trick pair of handcuffs. After the boys would handcuff Dean, he would use a key to unlock the cuffs behind his back. When Dean in turn handcuffed the boys, they soon realized there was no trick. They were now locked in cuffs. If this sounds familiar to you, it's most likely due to the fact that John Wayne Gacy used the exact same ruse. Gacy's fondness for the handcuff trick has been mentioned in many documentaries and articles. In 1973, it was Elmer Wayne Henley who shot Coral. As Henley pointed the gun at Coral's head, Dean taunted him, shouting at him to pull the trigger. Henley did pull the trigger, striking Coral directly in the head. The bullet lodged in Coral's skull and merely rendered him unconscious. Like a scene from a horror movie, as Henley and two other teens were trying to escape, Coral came to and charged the teens, completely nude and holding a large hunting knife. Henley unloaded the pistol, killing Coral. After Dean Coral's death, Houston police only investigated the bodies that Henley and Brooks led them to. From the date David Brooks witnessed his first murder in the winter of 1970, until the last murders in July of 1973, a boy was killed on the average of once every six weeks. If Dean Coral had never killed prior to 1970, that would be a behavior not exhibited by any known serial killer in world history. Back in Dallas, on August 17th, three days after John Norman had been arrested, and nine days after Dean Coral was shot, Assistant Police Chief Don Steele addressed the obvious appearance that a child prostitution ring had been uncovered. Steele told reporters, We have nothing definite yet to connect the two, but our investigation will continue, both in Houston and Dallas, until we are satisfied the two homosexual operations were independent of each other. During the last week of August 1973, Houston homicide detectives received a letter from a California man named Stephen Dale Ahern. Ahern was a male porn star, prostitute, and confidential informant for the Los Angeles Police Department. Ahern wrote in his letter, that in 1971, after placing an ad in The Advocate, his travel expenses were paid to Houston. Once in Texas, he was photographed by a man named Roy Ames. Ames invited him to the apartment of Dean Coral for an s &M party. When police called Dale Ahern to follow up on his letter, they were told that Roy Ames was a major child pornographer. Ahern told officers that he recognized at least one of Coral's victims from Roy Ames' pornography. Mr. Ahern gave the names and issue numbers of magazines for police to investigate. Houston police were able to obtain 
at least some of these magazines and agreed that a few of the boys did appear to be Coral's victims. Ahern also told police that he believed Roy Ames to be responsible for 30% of all the child pornography made in America. Detectives noted that Roy Ames' pornography depicted torture. Dean Coral tortured all of his known victims. In fact, Coral had a homemade board with rope and handcuffs that he could transport in his van. Along with this, he brought a toolbox filled with sexual devices, among other things. By September of 1973, the Houston investigation seemed to stall. Irate citizens demanded to know what the police were doing. The response from Houston was that the families had been through enough. There was no reason to continue their investigation. Finally, the citizens formed a grand jury to find out why the police had stopped pursuing other people involved in abusing their children. On November 11, 1973, the verdict was in. The grand jury found that police had stopped pursuing investigation of their perpetrators in Houston and nationally on September 1st, only weeks after finding 27 dead boys. The jury found the district attorney's office and police department, quote, lacked professional imagination, thoroughness, and coordination. Uh, some uh, people trying to make it appear that the police department uh, has not done uh, all that it could or should have done in these cases. The police department feels that these parents are not exactly uh, discharging their own responsibility so far as, uh, as raising and disciplining their children. The possible involvement and criminal activities of others had been ignored. As for the Houston Prosecutor's Office, the grand jury found that only one prosecutor had been assigned to the case. Said prosecutor had not been assigned until September 24th. Just one month after the grand jury's report, in December of 1973, Roy Ames' Houston warehouse was raided. Postal inspectors found over four tons of child pornography. Slides, magazines, and film reels were confiscated. There is no record of an investigation to match Coral's 27 known victims with the boys depicted in the seized child pornography. On September 16, 1974, a federal grand jury in Houston indicted Roy Clifton Ames on one count of conspiracy and ten counts of mailing obscene material. Less than six months after his indictment, Houston police served search warrants on Ames' warehouse and his home. This time, over 10,000 photos, 1,000 movies, and 200 magazines were seized. The Houston Juvenile Squad positively matched 11 of Dean Corll's victims with boys depicted in Ames' pornography. As a result of the raid, Ames was arrested on March 11, 1975, and charged with two counts of sexual abuse of a child. Ames made bail, and yet another warrant for Ames was served on April 5th at the Travel Lodge on Heights Boulevard. Six charges of compelling the prostitution of a minor were filed against Ames on June 16, 1975. Once again, Houston police did not pursue the link with Dean Coral. The parents of the boys have already suffered enough. There would be problems of positive identification. And we have the leader of the porno ring anyway. Roy Ames had made significant profits from child pornography. Using multiple attorneys, most of the charges filed against Ames by the state of Texas in 1975 were dismissed. Reasons for the dismissal included Fourth Amendment problems with the search warrants and the difficulty of getting teenage boys to testify about being victims of sexual abuse. As a result, Roy Ames walked out on parole less than four years after he went to prison. 
Back to John Norman. He is troubled by an urging inside that even he does not understand. Deep in his subconscious mind, he knows that he is wrong. But his rationalizations keep him from fighting his abnormal behavior. This man is a child molester. He is a dangerous, calculating criminal that knows no bounds in obtaining fulfillment of his desires. He is ill, mentally ill, and sensitive, with a wild, running imagination that will set him off at a moment's notice. After making bail on his 1973 Dallas arrest, Norman assumes the alias Stephen Gurwell and flees to Illinois, where he is harbored by a client of his escort service. In Homewood, Norman spends his days loitering around a restaurant frequented by 13-year-olds. Eventually, he convinced one boy to accept a ride home. Once in his car, Norman took the boy to his apartment and gave him a beer. The boy immediately told his friends that they could all come and drink at Norman's apartment. By October of 1973, Norman was arrested for luring ten boys to the Homewood apartment and sexually assaulting as many as he could. He was charged with six counts of taking indecent liberties with a child, six counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor, and two counts of deviant sexual assault. All the boys were around the age of 13 or 14. Homewood police also found 2,000 index cards inside the apartment. While locked in the Cook County Jail, Norman began the Delta Project. He established a newsletter to advertise his service and to plead for donations for his bail. He spent 16 hours a day writing clients. Norman's latest scheme had him coordinating a string of child stables. Pimps would house two to four boys inside each house which signed on to his network. Inside Norman's newsletter, pimps were referred to as sustaining members. The boys were referred to as cadets, and the houses as Delta dorms. The first edition of the Delta Project pamphlet featured the headshots of five boys from Maine, New York, Florida, and Texas. Norman advertised his fees, which he claimed would be split between his defense fund and each individual boy's self-development fund. Soon he enlisted the help of Philip Paskey in the jail on a murder charge. Norman and Paskey were able to mail out three editions of the Delta Project pamphlets from jail before they were discovered. Once Paskey was released, he ran the Delta Project from the outside. As a cover job, he managed to gain employment at a city pool in Chicago. To add insult to injury, Paskey was paid with federal tax dollars through the Comprehensive Employment Training Act, then referred to as CETA. You may be thinking that Philip Paskey, who had just avoided his murder charge in a plea bargain for armed robbery, was hired to clean the pool. You would be wrong. Paskey was hired as a children's supervisor for the pool. Philip Paskey was also acquainted with John Wayne Gacy. This paycheck was written to him by Gacy. Just recently, former Cook County Prosecutor Terry Sullivan has confirmed this is authentic on WGN News. WGN also found letters written by Gacy while in prison describing Paskey as a dangerous pimp. John Wayne Gacy also mentioned John Norman and Philip Paskey by name in an interview given from Death Row. Just as in Texas, Illinois investigators never pursued the link between these men, the child prostitution service, and the boys murdered by a serial killer. In short order, Norman's pleas for help were answered, and his bail was paid from one of his clients. Now free on bond, Norman became affiliated with the men behind a boy love magazine named Hermes. One man affiliated with Hermes was Patrick Townsend. Townsend hosted a gay radio show in Chicago. Mr. Townsend had a 15-year criminal record for fraud and sexual offenses. 
he had once even managed to escape from a mental institution. Publisher of Hermes Magazine was a 40-year-old married father of two named Eldon Gill Rusty Wake. Wake worked in the audiovisual department at a Lutheran school named Trinity University, located in Lake Forest, Illinois. Wake had previously been employed at a children's home and two children's camps. One of those camps was in Michigan, where he served as director. Chicago police discovered Hermes when a citizen found a copy of the publication at the corner of Clark and Diversity on the near north side. The individual who found it was so disgusted, they brought the magazine directly to police. Hermes contained drawings and photographs of boys, along with short stories and personal ads. Hermes was printed every two months, each edition costing $1.25 and had a circulation of 5,000 per issue. Unbelievably, Rusty Wake used his personal mailing address for the magazine. Police arrived to arrest Wake and his wife as they were packing to go on the run. The children had already been set ahead of them. Wake's wife was a special education teacher at a local public school. In the end, Wake only received two years probation and a $500 fine. John Norman was eventually convicted on his child molestation charges from Homewood, Illinois, and sentenced to four years, four months, and one day, minus the time he had spent on the Delta Project inside the Cook County Jail. With his arrest, the molester's world of abnormality crumbles. He is frightened, confused, and embarrassed. He can give no reasons for his actions because he does not understand them. He is now even unable to rationalize, and his conflicting values begin to take their toll in mental anguish. He is a criminal by definition and will be punished as prescribed by law. Part of his punishment will result in treatment of his mental disorder. It is hoped that the treatment will prove successful. By June of 1978, Norman was arrested again, and once again, police seized thousands of index cards containing the personal information on clients, pink index cards this time. Raymond Woodall, from the New Orleans Tour Guide Service, had his own index card. Philip Paskey was hanging out in Norman's Chicago apartment during his latest arrest for photographing and molesting two minors both wards of the state, both in DCFS care. Norman had renamed the Delta Project the Creative Corps, and the mailer was now named Mail Call. He was in the process of pimping out the two boys to a man in Canada when police raided his apartment. Although not arrested with Norman, Paskey was under suspicion for the murder of three teens behind a gas station in Chicago. One boy, Michael Salcedo, also in DCFS care, was scheduled to testify against Norman. All three boys had been sliced up and stabbed to death with a knife. Chicago police later arrested members of the Latin King Street Gang for the murders. At this point in the story, Philip Paskey's previous murder arrest, the one which landed him in the Cook County Jail where he first met John Norman, bears mention. At 19 years old, Paskey, along with an 18 and a 20 year old male, knocked on the door of a 65 year old man named McCurley. The young men told Mr. McCurley they had gotten his name from a coin shop and asked if he would be willing to sell them any. After forcing their way into the house, Mr. McCurley was stabbed to death in front of his wife. Back in 1973, Police in Texas had forwarded the 50,000 index cards they seized from Norman in Dallas to the State Department in Washington, D.C. After Norman's latest arrest in Illinois, detectives in Chicago called the State Department in order to review these cards, 
so they could compare the evidence and investigate Norman's clients. Much to their surprise, the detectives were told the State Department no longer had these index cards. Next, reporters from the Chicago Tribune called the State Department to ask what had happened to the evidence. They were told that all 50,000 cards had been shredded because the State Department could find no evidence of passport fraud. At this, the reporters pointed out that a Lieutenant Hancock of the Dallas Police Department had separated all index cards containing the names of Texas public and state employees for special assistance in investigating. Lieutenant Hancock had further stated that some of them were prominent people and others were federal employees in Washington, D.C. The State Department had no explanation as to why they had not forwarded this evidence to the FBI or postal inspectors, nor did they have any further comment. Norman was released from prison in 1982. By February, he was arrested in Denver for soliciting a child for sex. Fleeing Colorado, Norman ended up in rural Pennsylvania. Under a new alias, Norman set up shop in a rural motel. He soon rented a house using the alias Clarence Eugene Jr., where he lured more teen boys. It appears Norman skipped town after failing to pay his rent. Pennsylvania police then discovered he had been publishing a child porn magazine named Handy Andy, which had at least 20 victims of the rural community. Norman was charged with 18 counts, including child abuse, indecent assault, indecent exposure, and deviant sexual intercourse, as well as interfering with the custody of a minor. In October of 1984, Norman was arrested again in Chicago. This time, he was extradited back to Pennsylvania. Incredibly, just three months later, in January of 1985, Norman got himself out of jail with the writ of habeas corpus. He fled Pennsylvania for the second time. Next, Norman turned up in DuPage County, Illinois, under the alias Patrick Nelson. Two boys told Bolingbroke police that a man had propositioned them for sex. When detectives arrived at a now 59-year-old John Norman's apartment, he leaped from a third-floor window and escaped. Police soon found him at a local hospital with a broken ankle. Once more, Norman was sent back to Pennsylvania. In November of 1986, while once again locked inside a Pennsylvania jail, Norman drew on his vast experience as a jailhouse lawyer. He managed to get his bail reduced to $7,500. Norman posted his bond and fled the state for a third time. In August of 1987, John Norman is arrested again, this time in Champaign, Illinois. A 20-year-old named Eric Kimball was arrested for harboring Norman. Kimball attempted suicide inside the county jail. In June of 1988, Norman is arrested in Denver. In his latest offense, Norman was arrested for felony sexual assault of a child. Norman successfully fought extradition to Pennsylvania, but was given a six-year sentence in Illinois. In January of 1989, Norman accepted a plea deal and received only 18 months for his crimes in Pennsylvania. After his latest release from the state of Illinois, Norman is convicted twice in California for the distribution of child pornography in 1995 and 1998. His victims were all young males, aged between 11 and 17. Can child molesters be rehabilitated? At least one Californian thought they could. In October of 2008, 
Over the protest of the rural residents, a San Diego Superior Court judge imposed John David Norman on the small town of Boulevard, California. Superior Court Judge David M. Gill directed authorities to release Norman, who at that time was being held at the county jail in Ote Mesa on or before November 15th. Mentoring and teaching and, and just community involvement generally, I think, remains an important part of my service. I've always thought it was important for judges to be involved in the life of the community, and I think we can do so without in any way compromising our uh, position. Norman was released on November 7th. Just 77 days later, on February 2nd, John David Norman was arrested. Aside from failing to attend psychotherapy and mailing letters to former acquaintances, Norman had passed a note to a teenage bag boy inside an El Centro grocery store. As you may have noticed, every time Norman is arrested, he never has bail money. Aside from his Dallas arrest, if he has an attorney, it's a public defender. Yet on almost every one of Norman's many arrests, his camera equipment and client list are confiscated. So how is it that John Norman immediately procures cameras, film, and mailing list every time he is released from custody? Add to that Norman ran his operation before the days of personal computers, personal printers, the internet, and digital cameras. His schemes were significantly more expensive to operate back then. The reason I brought Gacy and Coral into this story was to point out the lack of investigation into how they obtained their victims. Imagine if prosecutors were able to tie just one of Ames or Norman's victims to either serial killer. Would Norman or Ames have continually walked out of custody to reoffend? Would this have been enough to prevent their countless victims since the mid-70s? Finally, let's talk about sensationalism. As I was putting this together, I noticed a few recent media pieces on Gacy and Coral. Each and every one mentions John Norman. Zero mentioned Roy Ames. It was even insinuated that John Norman may have killed, or had boys killed. Sensationalism is a cheap and easy way to drum up readers or viewers. In doing this, you in no way help the victims find justice. In fact, you do them a disservice. When I mentioned Philip Paskey's arrest for murdering a senior citizen, it most likely got your attention. In fact, that story is true. If I were to tell you the whole story, as I am about to, you will see how the media willfully misleads people. The boy who was killed behind a Chicago gas station, Michael Salcedo, was stabbed 28 times. His brother Arthur Salcedo and friend Frank Musa were the other two victims. Placido Leboy, Juan Caballero, and Luis Ruiz have all been convicted for that crime. The murders were entirely gang-related. No one paid the Latin King members to carry out a hit. Norman had absolutely nothing to do with the boy's deaths. Some stories about Norman mention a boy murdered in Homewood, Illinois. Kenneth Hellstrom was in fact set to testify against John Norman. He was one of the boys John Norman lured to an apartment with beer, immediately after Norman had fled Texas in 1973. Kenny Hellstrom was murdered by a classmate after an argument. Kenny's murderer confessed 14 years ago. Although this information is readily available, some journalists continue to draw parallels which do not exist. Parallels they know do not exist. By willfully misleading people, such stories ultimately make it more difficult to uncover the many men Norman bought and sold boys to, an untold number of child molesters who have escaped any form of justice for decades. Although the statute of limitations has run out for their crimes, their victims deserve to have these men publicly outed. This is still possible.